Across Westeros, the winds of war were blowing up the narrow sea as well. The murder of Shikario Lotha of Lys, the admiral who presided over the Triarchy's disaster in the gullet, proved to be the spark that engulfed the three sisters in flames, fanning the smouldering rivalries of Tyrosh, Lys, and Mir into open war once again. It is commonly accepted that Shikaro's death was a personal matter, and that the arrogant admiral was slain by one of his rivals for the favour of a courtesan known as the Black Swan. At the time, however, his death was seen as political killing, and the Mirish was suspected as a result. When Lys and Mir went to war, Tyrosh seized the opportunity to assert its dominance over the Stepstones once more. To press that claim, the Archon of Tyrosh called up Rancalio Rydun, the flamboyant Captain General who had once commanded the Triarchy's fleet against Daemon Targaryen and the Sea Snake many years before. Rancalio overran the islands quickly, putting the reigning king of the Narrow Sea to death, only to decide to claim the crown for himself, betraying the Archon and his native city. This confused, four-sided war that followed had the effect of closing the southern end of the Narrow Sea to all trade, cutting off King's Landing, Duskendale, Maidenport and Goldtown from commerce with the east. Not ideal when trying to rebuild a war-torn kingdom, Pentos, Bravos and Lorath were similarly affected and sent envoys to King's Landing in the hopes of bringing the Iron Throne into the Grand Alliance against Rancalio and the quarrelsome daughters. So Tyler Lannister entertained them lavishly, but refused their offer. It would be a grave mistake for Westeros to become embroiled in the endless quarrels of the three cities, he informed the Council of Regents. Some say this was the best decision that Tyler Lannister would make during his time as Hand of the King. Within the walls of the Red Keep, there were whispers about the King and Queen as well. The royal marriage was troubled from the very first, and the idea of binding the two rival claims of the parents was not going to be that simple. Both bride and groom were children after all. Aegon III was now 11, and Jehera only 8. Once wed, they had very little contact with one another, save on formal occasions, and even then that was rare, as the little queen was loath to leave her chambers. Both of them are broken, Grand Maester Munkin declared in a letter to the Conclave of Maesters in Old Town. The girl had witnessed the murder of her twin brother, Jaehaerys, at the hands of blood and cheese, and in the same moment lost her mother as well, as Helena would never be the same again. The king had lost all four of his own brothers as well, then watched his uncle, Aegon II, feed his mother Rhaenyra to a dragon. They are not normal children, Munkin wrote. They have no joy in them. They neither laugh or play. The girl wets her bed at night and weeps inconsolably when she is corrected. Her own lady say she's eight, going on four. Had I not laced her milk with sweet sleep before the wedding, I am convinced the child would have collapsed during the ceremony. And as for the boy king, the Grand Maester went on. Aegon shows little interest in his wife or any other girl, to be honest. He does not ride or hunt or joust, but neither does he enjoy sedentary pursuits, such as reading, dancing or singing. Though his wits seem sound enough, he never initiates a conversation, and when he's spoken to, his answers are so curt, one would think the very act of talking to him was painful. He has no friend save for the bastard boy Game and Powhair, and seldom sleeps through the night. During the hour of the wharf, he can often be found standing by the window, gazing up at the stars, but when I present him with Archmaester Layman's Kingdom of the Skies, he shows little interest. Aegon seldom smiles and never laughs, but neither does he display any outward signs of anger or fear, save in regards to dragons, the very mention which sends him into a rage. Orwell was wont to call his grace calm and self-possessed, but I say the boy is dead inside. He walks in the halls of the Red Keep like a ghost. Brothers, I must be frank. I fear for our boy king, and I fear for the Seven Kingdoms. The Maester's fears, alas, would prove to be well-founded in time. As bad as 131 AC had been, the next two years would be much worse for the king, for the queen, for Westeros. It began on an ominous note, when the former Grand Maester Orwell was discovered in a brothel called Mother's, near the lower end of the Street of Silk. Shorn of his hair and beard and chain of office and going by the name Old While, he had earned his bread by sweeping, scrubbing, inspecting patrons of the house for pox, and mixing moon tea and some potions of tansy and penny royals for the working girls of the brothel, to rid themselves of unwanted children. No one paid or while any mind, that is, until he took it upon himself to teach some of Mother's younger girls to read. One of his pupils demonstrated her new skills to a sergeant in the gold cloaks, who in turn grew suspicious, and led the old man in for questioning. The truth soon emerged. 
the penalty for deserting the Night's Watch is death. For Orwell had never technically sworn a vow, most still considered him an oathbreaker. There was no question of allowing him to take a ship for the war. The original sentence of death that Lord Stark had pronounced on him must apply, the regents agreed. So Tylan did not deny this, though he pointed out the office of King's Justice had yet to be filled, and as a blind man, he was a poor choice to swing the sword himself. Using that for his pretext, the hand instead confined Orwell to a tower cell, a far too comfortable sum charged, until such a time a suitable headsman could be found. Neither Septon Eustace nor Mushroom were deceived. Orwell had served with Sir Tylan on Aegon II's Queen Councils, and plainly, old friendships and the memory of all they had endured played some part in the hand's decision. The former Grand Maester was even provided with a quill, ink and parchment, so it might continue his confessions. And so he did for the best part of two years, setting down the lengthy history of the reigns of Viserys I and Aegon II, but would later prove to be such an invaluable source for his successor's true telling. Less than a fortnight later, reports reached King's Landing of a band of wildlings from the Mountains of the Moon descending upon the Vale of Arran in larger numbers to raid and plunder, and Lady Jane Arran left the court and sailed for Goldtown to see to the defence of her own lands and people. There were also ominous stirrings along Dornish marches too, for Dawn had a new ruler in Aleandra Martel, a brazen girl of 17 who'd fancied herself the new Nymeria, and had every young lord south of the Red Mountains vying for her affections. To deal with the incursions, Lord Caron took his leave of King's Landing as well, hastening back to Nightsong in the Dornish marches. Thus, the seven regents became five. The most influential of these was plainly the sea snake, Corlys Velaryon, whose wealth, experience and alliances made him first amongst equals. Even more telling, he seemed to be the only man the young king was willing to trust. For all these reasons, the realm suffered a terrible blow on the sixth day of the third moon of 132 AC, when Corlys Velaryon, Lord of the Tides, collapsed while ascending the serpentine steps in the Red Keep in King's Landing. By the time Grand Maester Munkin came rushing to his aid, the sea snake was dead, 79 years of age. He had served four kings and a queen, sailed to the ends of the earth, raised House Valarian to its unprecedented levels of wealth and power, married a princess who might have been queen, fathered dragon riders, built towns and fleets, proved his valour in times of war, his wisdom in times of peace. The seven kingdoms would never see his like again. With his passing, a great hole was torn in the tattered fabric of the seven kingdoms. 